Yep. Tons of people. All right. So uh, this is going to be make a module for you and others. Creation and submission to Fez. Um, as we were talking about a little earlier, this is going to be a little bit more about making your module and then just kind of a quick little Fez tutorial at the end. Uh, I'm Matt Stuglish, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, I do most of my work is on the international modules in Raku. So if you've used any of those, you've used some of my stuff. Um, so let's get started here. Um, in the talk, I'm going to talk about a couple things. First off, you look at the title here, right? Make a module for you and others. What does this mean? First off, what is a module? All right, why do I want it in my code? How can it benefit other people? How do we make them? How do we share it or use it? And then finally, what is Fez? All right, so this title is very uh, compact version of you know, what this talk is about. Okay. So first off, what is a module? All right, it's reusable code. All right. And anytime we get this, it uh, makes our life a little bit easier. Also, this is a big thing for Raku. A module is generally going to be pre-compiled for us. And so sometimes you have some very large modules uh, that might take a couple seconds to compile. Um, if you pre-compile them all, then it's basically instantaneous. Um, and so one of the approaches that you'll see sometimes uh, people do for like applications is the actual application will be just like three lines where it says use the module and then start from that, from that module's exported stuff. Uh, so it can really help us speed things up because it doesn't have to be done in that initial pass of the of your code. Yes. Do I need? Okay. Can we hear me? Oh, wait. Do I need to do the Ruth one? Todd. <laughs> All right. Uh, so it is also uh, it can be as simple as just a little custom sort routine. So if you you know write like a little anything that's useful to you, you might want to just go ahead and stick it into a module. But it can also be as complex as a full service web services library. So they can be very, very small. They can also be very, very large and complex. Really, how, whatever stuff you need to reuse. Now, next question, why would you want it in your code? For the speedy. OK, I already mentioned this. Because we get those pre-compiled benefits, uh, stuff will go faster. But also, if you're not rewriting code, right, you can reuse it and you're saving developer time. Right? If I don't have, even if I've got that custom sort routine that I use in all of my code, if I don't have to keep rewriting it every single time, you know, I get to save that little bit of thought process. I just know that it works. All right? And that's a big thing. I know that it works. If I've written my module, I have lots of tests in it, I, I can be confident that I'm not going to make a typo in reusing sort of different patterns uh, that I've used in the past. And of course, it makes our code cleaner and more maintainable, right? Because again, one less thing that you've got to have in your code, one less thing that you have to worry about, one less thing that you've got to test on your own. If you've got this module, you know that it's just going to work, again, if it's been battle tested, right? And of course, it saves time. And then, of course, how can it benefit others? Basically the same way. They get the speedy. They don't have to rewrite the code. They know that it's battle-tested code. Their code becomes cleaner and more maintainable, and it saves them time. So when you write a module, you get all these benefits, and then also other people can get benefits from it. All right, this is actually kind of looping back a little bit to what Ruth was talking about in her opening talk. You know, if you get like a little module, there's a little bit of code, a little snippet that you use that you find useful, push it out there. Someone else might be able to find it. And either A, they might be able to use it and, and find it you know, useful in their own production code or whatnot, or they can learn from it. The number of things that I've learned from little modules that, you know, that Liz has published, you know, that just some of hers are just like these little quick five line, six line, little cutesy things, but they actually hit some pretty important topics in Raku code. Um, I think she had one where it was just, I'm going to allow you to use a, uh, a subscript number in a variable name, which seems really, you know, kind of like, well, why would you want to do this? What's cool about looking at the code? Well, it actually has to implement a slang to do it. So if you want to know how to change the definition of an identifier within Raku code, that module teaches you how to do it. And it's a little five line, so there's no other, maybe not five line, 10 line code, but you see it without a lot of other noise around it. 
Okay, so how do we make use of it? I'm um, gonna go, this is kind of the bulk of the talk and we talk about the anatomy of a module, right? How we set up our exports, how we can give a module some polish. Um, this is something that uh, I think we need to work on a little bit right now early on in, in the Raku ecosystem. Um, certainly some of the more mature libraries like in the Perl world have gotten a lot more of this, um, but just other things to think about. Then also we set up our, our Meta 6 file uh, and then go about importing it. So here we've got uh, the anatomy of a module. Uh, and this is just sort of uh, what you would expect when you've got your directory, right? These are the things that you need, or some of the things that you, some of them are extras, but uh, most important thing is your Meta6 file, which I'll get to in a little bit, but this basically says, you know, hi, my name is whatever your module is, and here's everything you need to know about me. And this is the file that gets used when um, there's some defaults that it will do, but really this is how you're going to want for Raku if it uses it or any other uh, library like any ecosystem like Fez or uh, you know, CPAN, they will use this file. Um, other, like Raku land is a sort of an indexer and it pulls all this information directly out of this Meta6 file. Um, so this is sort of the... I don't know if we want to call this the heart or the brain of the module, probably the heart. It keeps everything going through. Then you've got your readme file. People should read it, you know. Uh, most of the time this is in markdown format because that works very nicely when people are viewing it on GitHub because it doesn't quite understand pod six. Um, your license, nice legalese. Most people, right, just like from the Perl world, use the artistic two license. Um, and then you've got the build file. Um, this is one, uh, you don't see it very often in very many uh, modules, um, but this one is one if you're, somebody's installing a module and there's some sort of local setup that you need to do uh, before the install actually happens, uh, you can write some extra code here in this uh, file and it'll handle it. I guess that should be Raku mod now, but this technically, the, that's the file name that the Zeph documentation still uses, so build.pm. I guess it can be Raku mod now. Um, and there's, those are the only files that you'll see. Then we've got a whole bunch of different directories, right? Obviously here the most important one is your lib directory. Uh, and that's where you put all of your Raku mod files. Uh, interestingly, there is actually no requirement for any particular file structure in there. Um, and so by default, if you just say like in your code, you say like use lib, you know, whatever, and there's no Meta6 file, it will interpret uh, each of your new directories as a new namespace. Uh, so if you have like foo slash bar dot Raku mod, it'll, you'd use it foo colon colon bar. But if you have a Meta6 file, you can rearrange anything you want inside of the Meta6 file. So you can just have a flat directory with no direct, or a lib directory with no other subdirectories, but then you can have very complex naming system uh, or vice versa. Um, then we have the test files. Um, just like with, uh, in the Perl world, right, you want to stick in your, your different tests here. Uh, the convention is, right, do, you know, zero, zero, dash, whatever most of the default is in, like if you use commas, just a quick sanity one, make sure it can load the module at all, and then you move on from there. Um, I don't know why people don't like to write test files. Actually, I do know why people don't like to write test files. It takes a lot of time and effort <laughs> to do good ones. I'm very bad about this, but I'm getting better. Um, but this is one that I think a lot of people need to work on is putting more of these in. Uh, then we have the resources folder. Um, this is kind of an interesting one. I've seen people lately uh, playing around with it uh, a little bit. And the idea of the resources folder is these are uh, non-code files that your module will need to use at some point during runtime. And you include them, uh, or you can access them via this special hash, uh, which is your, uh, the question mark one, so it's a compile time variable. Um, and a couple of misconceptions that people have with this resources uh, directory is they think that inside the code it will show up as a, like an IO path that you can then introspect and, you know, traverse down you know, directory, the whole directory structure. And actually, the truth is, you cannot. Um, you have to reference in your code the exact file name and path 
And the idea of this, because I was asking around, well, why, why don't we make it this way? Why can't we have this traversable you know, structure in there? Um, and there are sort of two things. One is all the file names get mangled during the install. And so you lose the directory structure in the install sort of uh, area. Um, but also, if you have the resources, you should know what your resources are ahead of time. Right? This is not something that's going to change. It's static. Uh, so, um, and I, I get that that can be a little difficulty. I've got some modules where I have some generated fi resource files. And so I might not necessarily know in my code which ones are reference or which ones are available. And so I just wrote another script that gives me a list of that and it puts in the resources file and then I can use that one to determine what stuff is in there. Um, but most of the time you won't need to, you shouldn't be expected to do any uh, heavy introspection on those files. Uh, you just do resources and then put in your uh, little hash access and then just say slurp in or things like that. Um, then we've got the uh, XT. Uh, this one's basically test files except they're not required for install. Uh, so if you've got some you just want to test to make sure that your module will work, those go in T. If you're wanting to do this deeper, more extensive, much longer uh, or complex tests, those would go under XT because an end user will not run those. So when Zeph is installing uh, a module, uh, it will only run the T's, not the XT's. Um, so you can kind of organize them accordingly. Um, then we've got bin files. Again, most modules aren't going to have this, but if you've got any compiled libraries that you're going to need at runtime, if you want to call them via native call, stuff like that, uh, that's the, the typical folder that you'll throw that into. Um, doc, kind of feel like it should have been docs, uh, but it's doc in singular. Um, and all of your you know, pod six files or markdown files, whatnot, those can all go uh, in there. And you, know, you can generate those automatically uh, with various with some of our different tools. And then personally, I use a, an extra one, tools. Um, this is not a standard part of the, the structure or anything, but I think it would be kind of a good kind of practice to use, which is to set it up in tools. Um, and this is one that I have, because I'm pulling in like for my CLDR or the time zone database, you know, I need to download the code, process it, set it up, get things into the resources folder, but that only needs to be done on the developer side. The end user is never going to run those tools, but I just kind of keep it in there nice and tucked away, and that doesn't get installed. So somebody might download the module. I don't even know if that folder gets uploaded into, Zep, into Fez, but uh, if they download it from like GitHub, once they install it, it'll, it won't be there, and they don't need it. Uh, so this, this is the module sort of structure that we have. Um, and you know, if you kind of start this out when you're working on a project, uh, life will go a lot easier. If you're using something like Comma, it kind of gets a lot of the setup for you. Um, but you know, this way if you're browsing or something, you know exactly kind of what you're looking at too. All right, so the next thing we have, now that we know what a module sort of, the anatomy of it, uh, the next question is how do we export? What, how do we decide you know, what we're going to be exporting? How do we go about exporting it? Uh, and this is one where we tried to make things in, in Raku pretty easy and straightforward. Right? You can just use an export trait. Uh, and so you just say, you know, sub foo is export. Voila. If in your module, they'll say use this module, and now they will have foo available to them. So that's all you have to do is add those two words, and you're done. Uh, you can also, you know, anything that's R scoped, you can also export as well. So you say our bar is export, done. Now that is available. Uh, Dollar sign bar will be in their code. Yeah, and I'm going to get to that one because there's that is another option here. <laughs> All right. Um, another cool thing we have here is that the, that trait, that export trait, can take arguments. Um, and so this is one where you know if you've got if for a very simple module you might not want to deal with this. Right, if you're just exporting one function, okay, who cares? We don't need options. But some modules, like if you've got a util, uh, if you just want to have like one util module that you use all your stuff in, um, then you can have, you know, tag them with different things. Uh, there's a couple that are uppercase, which are default and mandatory. 
So that means you know, they've got to import it, or if they don't specify in the import statement, um, that's what they'll get. Um, but you can do things like an expert one is one that I like to use, or if you're in a development mode one, you know, or something uh, that actually you don't think people are going to want 90% of the time, but that they might want, then you can just kind of add them in uh, with this. And then when they use them, right, you just say use foo. And for like this, this example here, right, you say use foo, you'll get foo because that's marked as default. And then if we have expert, right, we'll get foo and bar. Um, and so, uh, you know, makes our life, life easy there. And again, this is a very simple way, very effective way, right, by tagging this to let people import what they want. Um, there is no way, if you, we don't, as if you're making a module, there is no way to actually, uh, if you don't provide a way for somebody to get a symbol, they cannot get it. Um, and this is something that has come up a couple times. People say, well, I want to get access to this, you know, subroutine that they've got in the module. If they don't have a way for you to, to grab it, you can't get it. If it's, if it's an hour scope, you, you could, I think. But uh, this is for the expert, like, pull it into the scope of your, of your current one. Uh, but if, yeah, if they've my scoped it, not getting it. Um, all right. And, um, well, the other reason that I like using, you know, these uh, grouping ones, right, and uh, naming them is a lot of modules, there's a very high chance that, you know, depending on what it is, certainly like a utility function one, there's a chance that you might have names that are very similar to other modules. And if two people import, right, they got the same names that they're using and each module is importing 300 name, you know, symbols, you're probably going to have a clash somewhere. So give people options to limit what they're importing in. It'll make everybody's life uh, happier. Uh, the default ones, I'm trying to think how, I'd have to double check on that one. Uh, but now one other way that you could do this, if, if you were to run into a case where you've got some like scoping issues, um, import statements are uh, themselves, like they are lexically scoped, so like you could just put in a brace, do it in there, and then you could alias those into something that's scoped outside of it, and then you can deal with that, but I mean. I don't want to deal with that <laughs> if I can avoid it. All right, now to get to what you were talking about with the uh, export sub. This is an option that we also have. Um, if you use the export sub, you will not actually list this in a module. Uh, so you won't have your header like unit module and the name. You just have a file that says sub export. And um, interesting here, you can uh, throw in arguments, whereas on the previous one, where we had the named one with the, in the module with the uh, is export, it will only take named arguments. But we can't do positional. Here it's the opposite. You get your positionals, but you don't get your names. Uh, and so you'll get whatever variables that people put in, and then you just have to, at the end, give a map. All right, and so here you can do, because this is a code block, right, you can do all sorts of other stuff in there if you want to do something very, you know, I don't know, if you want to import Roman numerals and you don't want to type out all the Roman numerals, you could write a function that creates a map of the first 100, 200, 300,000 Roman numerals and link them to numbers. <laughs> Please don't do that, but <laughs> you could if you wanted. Is there any way to have both a positional and a... I have not figured that one out yet. Uh, I would like that, but yeah. Um, and I'm sure as soon as I get done with this, uh, Nick will, you know, go on and be like, no, this is exactly how you do it. You don't understand. And sorry, Nick, in advance. All right. Uh, and then we can also do um, another option is to do, instead of using that is export with those uh, um, arguments to the is export, you can also just do packages and uh, just our scope it. Because that's actually all that these other ones are doing is that they are creating a package, a, a um, unit export like sort of package thing uh, to pull them in. So this is sort of what's really happening kind of under the ground, under, under the hood. All right, so this is how basically you do all of your exporting. 99% um, of the time, just use the export trait. This is only for kind of more complex uh, things. It's obviously much, much more powerful. Um, but the other reason I like to avoid this one, if you can, 
sometimes it's not always possible, but if you can avoid it, uh, it's better because a lot of the IDs don't totally understand this. Because if you can imagine, right, for that sub export, it's got to run the code to know what's going to be in there. And that's not out of the realm of possibility, but I don't know, maybe you're exporting something based on a non-fixed condition, like the date. I don't know why you would do that, but theoretically, right, it could be that that script is run and it imports a symbol based on the date. Well, you know, the ID is not going to be able to figure that out quite exactly. Don't do that. Please don't do that. You can see somebody challenging themselves for it. All right. Next, we want to give our modules some polish. And this is something I don't really have a whole lot of examples for, but I just want to kind of go things to think about when you're writing a module. First off, ask yourself, what does your module actually do? All right. Scope creep is bad. Don't do it. All right. Sometimes there's a reason for it. If you can justify it, go ahead and do it. But you know, at a certain point, you might want to just think about breaking something into a different module. Uh, I certainly had to do that in, uh, in some of my international ones. I said, okay, no, we're going to start splitting these and let them just import each other. Um, and a couple that I have where I've got like a data source a module that really just providing data source and then one that uses it. Well, if you split them now, don't try to do both in one. Split them and now I can update with the new data regularly without having to just you know, push out a new version of the other module. Um, obviously some you're just going to get gigantic, like Crow has a huge scope, but that's just kind of the nature of that, that module. Another thing to think about is how other people are going to interact with your module. Uh, and I think, you know, this is something actually people coming from the Perl world, you know, can think about. It's like, well, do you want object-oriented one? Do you want to do procedural code, right? Um, and in the Raku world, I think you want to think about the same thing. It's like, how would you want to use this code? What is the most, uh, you know, uh, logical way, you know, that this is going to integrate into your code? Name your variables accordingly. You know, don't give horrible names. Don't start using camel case because we all use, we've all kind of settled on kebab case. Please use that. You know, don't do you know, lowercase class names, right? Just kind of think about how people are going to use it, you know, uh, if you can help people out where they're not having to create manually a whole bunch of objects, if you can automate a little bit of that to save them a little bit of line noise, go ahead and do that because you're going to use your module so you'll get a feel for how that's going to go and, you know, other people will benefit from that. So, yeah, those are the different things. Uh, another thing you can also think about is doing um, multis. Uh, and so an example of this one would be in JSON Tiny. They've got a function called to JSON. You want that to be multi, right? Because if I have my own custom class, right, I might just want to add in a to JSON function, you know, that that can then use. And so if you think about sometimes ahead of time, well, is this something that somebody might want to extend in some way? Is this something that, you know, that somebody could uh, benefit from being able to throw in with their own classes and stuff, you know, allow that. Um, because otherwise they have to go through, I mean, you could still do it, but you have to like wrap the function and then do all that, and it's just a hassle. Whereas if you can say multi sub to JSON, my class and the signature, everybody's life is easier. Right? Also, are you being nice to the IDEs? Again, a little bit of that with the export symbols, but um, also things like typing. You know, in your signatures, throw in the return type. Um, Little tiny things like that can help it because if you have a sequence of calls, like a chain of calls, if it knows, you know, what's being returned, then it can give you better, you know, completion for, you know, uh, method name completion, things like that. So try to be nice to the IDEs because, yeah, in real code, you don't have to give a return type. It'll run just fine. But if you add that little bit in, right, other people's lives get a little bit easier. Do you have test files? <laughs> Again. Do as I say, not as I do, because I'm very bad about this, but add in those test files. Try to get as much coverage as you can. I think uh, comment at this point now will show you some of your test coverages. Uh, I think that's a f uh, in the past couple months they, they added that in there. I could be wrong on it. Um, and this is a big one. Um, do you use extended names for modules? Uh, and so when I started writing this talk, um, Tony O is one of the people who uh, works on uh, Fez. Uh, it was like, you need to hammer this point. And what does this mean? Well, in the Perl world, um, the namespacing was a delicate issue because CPAN is like, well, if I'm the first person to publish a module that says you know, in the international uh, namespace and I have INTL, whatever, I own that. <laughs> Nobody else can use it. And so if I have 
really bad modules in there, somebody's gotta come up with a new namespace for it. You know, they can't just replace mine, right? Um, in the Raku world, that's not the case. I can have a module that's called foo, and somebody else can have a module that's called foo, and both can exist in the ecosystem at the same time. This is a good thing, it can also lead to some issues, because I can just say use foo, and it'll go and try to find uh, a module called foo. But if there's multiple ones in the ecosystem, it's gonna have to pick and choose, or I don't remember exactly how it, uh, it tries to resolve that one. Um, but then also it could be that, let's say I take my module foo down from the ecosystem and then somebody else uploads a foo into the ecosystem. Right now it's looking like security issues. In fact, actually I think that's what you can do. If you just upload one with a higher version, it'll just select that one with the naming conflict. So you can have this sort of extended name adding in version number and the off field, which is, uh, you know, the source basically for this. So you'd have some, I'll get into that in a little bit when we talk about the meta six files. Uh, but you basically say, no, no, you should only grab this one from, you know, the Zet or the, the Fez username, you know, whatever. And that way everything is nice and sort of uh, safe. If we go back into the archives, you know exactly which one we're talking about. And you can put in there with versions, uh, the way versions work in Raku, you can say like, I want version six or higher or I want version 6.1 or higher, so don't give me seven, but you can give me 6.3 or 6.4. Um, and so as long as you maintain semantic versioning with your module, um, things are great, and that way you make sure your module is only importing the correct people's modules. So make sure anytime you use a use statement, I know it's extra work to add in, you know, this extra ver and auth into it, but it will make your code long term a lot better and will help the ecosystem um, out as well. And again, this is one that I'm re I'm updating all of my modules to, to start doing as well, because I get it, it adds a little bit of extra code noise, but it will make things uh, honestly secure for down the road. Also, have you documented, right? Raku has really taken documentation to the next level, right? We have all of our little declarator uh, pod, right? You can integrate all of your pod into uh, your module and you can make, you know, if you just have a one file module, you can have a one stop shop for everything in it. Um, and I point out this helps IDEs. So if you have a class and you put at the beginning, like right above your class uh, declaration, you put in, you know, your, uh, you know, pound sign pipe, and then you uh, type out a description of your class. If somebody hovers over a variable with that type, it will give that description to them, just like your Java docs or other things like that, except, you know, this is actually in your Raku code, and comma even will do if you have a fully documented file, it'll just pull up a little reference panel. And it'll say, here's the class, here are all those methods, here's the descriptions of them and everything. So add this little bit of documentation in. Again, it, you know, it's, I know none of us like to go through and add the documentation, but if you're gonna use it, let other people use it, go ahead and add that in there for them. All right, um, so that's, Soapbox over. <laughs> All right. Uh, setting up your Meta 6 files. Um, all right, we've got our most important fields here, which is your module name. The auth is what I was talking about, making sure that you're grabbing it from the correct person. Um, and generally, you just say like the source. So Fez uh, plus the username. You might do GitHub to say, hey, you should download this from only from the GitHub user with this name. And if it mismatches, you can suddenly get complaints in the install. Um, your version number, again, version numbers are very um, flexible in, in Raku. Um, most of the time we just use the semantic you know, naming conventions, but uh, really you can have as many dots as you want along the way and sort of as many, you know, if you want to do alphabetical or numbers or anything, and there you go. Um, and then we have this provides statement. Uh, and this is where you can actually set up the names that people will use. Remember I said in that lib folder, it does not matter your directory structure as long as you've got it here. And so I could have this path to module file, you know, and it can be as long as I want, but I only want it to import as these two, you know, the namespace module and then the name, right? You can even have them aliased. And I've done this in a couple modules where I decided I didn't like my namespace that I had chosen for one as I started adding new modules. So, okay, I aliased it for a little bit. I said I'm gonna keep aliasing this for the next like two versions and then I'll kill it um, to kind of get people to nudge them in the right direction. Um, 
And so these are the four you really need. And then we've got some others that are fairly useful. We got your author, and this is just a human readable name. So this is not one that people are gonna be like processing over or things like that, so you can kind of put whatever you want into it. And very nicely, it's an array. Because <laughs> something might be written by more than one person. Um, so feel free to put in as many names as you want. Um, license, we use the SPDX identifier here. Um, I guess technically we don't need the license file, but everybody always does both. Um, and we've got API. Um, I think only one real module has started to use this one, uh, which is the uh, RED, uh, which is the OPM uh, that we've got. But you could theoretically have your module and have two different APIs for it. And somebody could select the API that they're using based off of that number. Um, but otherwise, maybe all else is equal. Um, you know, if you want to keep continuing development on the two different tracks, um, you can just tag them differently. And then we have, speaking of tagging, you have got your actual tags in there. Uh, this one, if you're on like Raku land or something like that and you're just searching up the tags, um, this is just what it uses. And a description, that's pretty straightforward. And then we've got the depends. And they're actually, um, uh, oh, it should be test depends, not build test. That's a typo on my part. Um, but these are three different dependencies, lists of dependencies that you can have. Um, depends is the most important one. If my module relies on somebody else's module, this is where I need to list it. And again, um, as we were mentioning, we want to do it fully qualified. So while mod that module that yours needs, that works, especially in testing and whatnot, if you really want to put the good polish on it and you know, really help out the ecosystem and everything, you would want to put in you know, a fully uh, qualified one. And here's a little plus sign there on the version. Again, we can just say, well, anything that's zero, dot, and higher than quality. Because, I mean, quality can be alphabetized. <laughs> All right. Um, you can also, if you have a build, maybe not for runtime, but for build time, you need to have a different uh, module available, then you can put it in there, and same for test, and it should be test depends. I'll fix that on the slides when I upload them. Um, so now we've got the ecosystems, uh, and this will pretty much be about uh, finishing us up here. Um, so we have CPAN, and for Raku, this, for Raku, not for Perl, for Raku is deprecated, all right? And again, part of this comes down to that namespacing issue. We want to be able to have people to have, uh, you know, have the same name for modules, but take advantage of this fact that, you know, uh, you have different, ver different versions there and different authors for them. Um, and also pause is kind of a little bit finicky to use and whatnot. Um, so then we came up with this Perl 6 ecosystem called P6C. This is now deprecated, but basically the way that this worked, kind of as a historical note, uh, is we had a gigantic master file on GitHub. It was called ecosystem, I think was the file name. Uh, and you just listed a source URL on GitHub. <laughs> or wherever you stored it, and that it could be found. And it would go to that one, it would pull up the, the Meta6 file, and then it would do everything. Anyway, it would index it based on that. Um, and that one, it's just people could very easily delete it. Maybe they delete their GitHub account, all this other kind of stuff, things disappear. Uh, it worked as kind of a substitute, you know, a quick little quick and dirty sort of version of an ecosystem. And I mean, it served us well for a number of years, but uh, people were finally looking a little more towards the future. Uh, and so we ended up with Fez. And this is a uh, new one that just came out in the past year. Uh, the name is a joke because sort of, because Zeph is what we use to install modules. And those pull it down, so we're gonna put it up, we're gonna go the opposite, so it's Fez. Yay puns, all right? Um, and if you wanna use it, it's actually really simple. Or okay, we already talked about a little bit what's different, it's much more modernized running on some server that Tony and Nick are doing. Um, but here's zero to 60 in just a couple lines, all right? So start with Zef, not Fez, Zef, install Fez, all right? And you get that. They even nice conveniently print out your usage as you install it. Just get kind of nice little touch there, all right? Um, this is actually a really great example of a well, well done little command line uh, thing there. And you can see where it says testing, or I know it's kind of really small there, but it, everything's like fully qualified and that's what you want to do there. Uh, then you just type in 
Fez register and it'll take you through. It'll say, hey, what's your email? What's your username? What's your password? And then it'll say, hey, registration successful. And then you log in and you just type in your username and password again. And uh, then it says, hey, would you like to have some publicly available, you know, like a public name, public email address, all that kind of stuff. And you're done. Then you just CD to your directory, wherever your module is, and you hit Fez check build. And it does some, you know, basic little levels of checking. When I did this on my first module, um, it actually was like, hey, and I, I left it up on here, it was like, hey, you got this file in your resources thing, but um, you didn't mention it in your Meta6 file. Are you sure? Like, what's going on here? And, it, and then it literally says, your module could use some sprucing up. <laughs> <laughs> It's very friendly <laughs> in its, you screwed up here, right? Um, but it's nice, it will do a little bit of checking for you um, so that you, you know, if there's an issue there, uh, it'll help you fix it. And obviously if there's something that's a, a much more severe issue, it'll let you know in advance. You know, you've got a file name that's totally wrong. And then you just hit Fez upload and it'll just say, hey, you did it. Your uh, distribution will be indexed shortly, boom, done. And when I did this the first time, literally it was, a, it took me about 30 or 45 seconds to get registered, to install, register, and upload, check and upload my first module. And it makes it, I mean, if you remember those of you who use Perl, the first time you uploaded something to CPAN. <laughs> takes a little bit like you get an email for the pause account, right? It takes a little while, you get that in. You know, if somebody else's namespace, you get permit, all that kind of stuff. Now it's just, you're done. And then uh, also one thing you might want to do, um, and I imagine this will change, but for me I had to do it was echo Estes to your git ignore. Because uh, it puts a little archive of your module in there. Uh, a couple other commands that you have in Fez. Uh, if you are on a new system that you didn't do that initial sign up on, just do Fez login. And it'll get you logged in. Uh, if you do Fez meta, it'll let you update your public uh, facing name and email address and all that. Uh, I did ask about the updating the actual like internal private email address. Right now there's not functionality to do that, but if you email Tony, he'll, or message Tony online, he can take care of that for you. Um, but hopefully that'll, more features will be there. You obviously reset password and remove, if you want to remove a distribution. Um, and if you just want to like basically log out and get everything off your computer, just rm, uh, it should be tilde, tilde slash dot fez config dot JSON. I'll fix that on the slides when I publish them. Um, and that's where it just stores its information. All right, and then lastly when we use our modules, right, in your terminal, oh, typos, uh, should be uh, zeph install your module name. Sorry, wrote this, not a lot of sleep. Uh, or for your own stuff, just cd into it and do zeph install, period. And everything gets all nicely and installed. Um, and then inside of Raku, use and then your module name, right? And then profit for you and others, All right? Uh, so any questions or comments with that? Yes. Uh, I don't know for the Fez, I haven't tr tested around because my mod, what? Oh yes, so the question was if, if on the, let's see, let me go back here, at this check build one, if, um, if there's a way to sort of skip uh, over that. I will admit I don't currently have any modules that have issues. <laughs> so I don't, I don't uh, know exactly what the, the handling of that would be, if it'll let you upload it without that check build. On your own local, one, if you're not uploading it to Fez, um, you can go ahead, if, if, if it's one, like an extra resource file or something, that's not an error, it's just like a, a warning equivalent, uh, everything will be fine. If there's an actual issue, um, like sometimes can happen, like there's a dependency that doesn't install properly, you can do um, with, you type in like zeph install dot, and then you do like dash dash force. And it'll say like, don't worry about those errors, just go ahead and install it no matter what. Um, or you need like force build or force install, there's a couple other options. So there are ways to skip if you, if you really need to. All right, any other questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, making that uh, JSON seems like a lot of work, is there automation yet? 
Yes, there is. There's actually a module called Meta6 <laughs> that will do that. Uh, and like also when you do in comma in the ID, it's just there. And thankfully that's one uh, that for the most part is uh, you touch it once and you just update your version number and then you're done. Uh, the only one I ever had to write a script for it was, and that actually uses that Meta6 module anyway to do it, was this CLDR one because I have, I don't remember how many files are in the resource one. I mean, it's, it's a lot because every single language code has two files uh, and I didn't want to write that by hand. <laughs> so I took the lazy route. Uh, but yeah, there are a couple tools for it. All right, any others? All right, well thank you for coming to this talk and I hopefully see you at my next talk in 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs>